I'm Sibeta Matsumoto, and in this video, we'll use the Euler angle description of rotations to describe the Lagrangian and the solutions to the equations of motion for the heavy spinning top. Our system generally can have three independent principal moments, but let's consider one that is symmetric, so that I11 is equal to I22. That means that E1 and E2 are any pair of orthogonal axes that are mutually orthogonal to the third principal axis, EZ. In this setup, psi is the angle the body spins around the E3 direction, theta is the angle that E3 makes with the Z axis, and phi is the rotation around the Z direction. So first off, let's take a look at how the physics works when we take the Euler angles to be our generalized coordinates. Since this is an orthonormal system, we can write any vector in terms of our directions E1, E2, and E3. In this coordinate system, our total angular velocity is given by omega 1 in the E1 direction, omega 2 in the E2 direction, and omega 3 in the E3 direction. From the definition of our Euler angles, we can also write the total angular velocity as phi dot in the z direction, theta dot in the e2 direction, and psi dot in the e3 direction. This isn't exactly our body frame, so let's express the z direction in terms of our body frame, and we get z hat is equal to cosine theta in the e3 direction minus sine theta in the e1 direction. So that means the three components of the angular velocity vector in terms of the principal axes are minus phi dot in the E1 direction plus theta dot in the E2 direction and psi dot plus phi dot cosine theta in the E3 direction. Likewise, the angular momentum in this coordinate system is I times omega or I11 omega 1 in the E1 direction, I22 omega 2 in the E2 direction, and I33 omega 3 in the omega 3 direction. In this coordinate system, the total angular momentum is minus I11 phi dot times sine theta in the E1 direction plus I11 times phi dot in the E2 direction. Note that I11 and I22 are the same, so I'm always going to write I11 when I would have otherwise written I22. Plus I33 times psi dot plus phi dot cosine theta in the E3 direction. We know that this last term here is just L3, which is equal to I33 times omega 3, which tells us that this term here is just omega 3. It'll end up helping us later if we write out the expression for the z component of the angular momentum. We end up with cosine theta times L3 minus sine theta times L1. That gives us I11 times phi dot times sine squared theta plus I33 times psi dot plus phi dot cosine theta times cosine theta. Remembering that this term here is equal to L3, we can write, we can write this as I11 times phi dot times sine squared theta plus L3 cosine theta is equal to LZ. It's convenient for us to rearrange this to arrive at an equation for phi dot in terms of the angular momentum components LZ and L3. So this tells us that phi dot is equal to LZ minus L3 cosine theta divided by I11 sine squared theta. And we'll be coming back to this a lot throughout the rest of this video. The other physical quantity we'll find useful is the kinetic energy, which is just one half the angular velocity dotted into the angular momentum. And this gives us one half I11 times phi dot squared sine squared theta plus theta dot squared plus one half I33 omega 3 squared. Let's imagine now that this object is a spinning top. It has mass m, and the distance to its center of mass is r. That tells us that it has potential energy, mgr cosine theta. The top is rotating about the z-axis at rate phi dot, which we just worked out to be Lz minus L3 cosine theta divided by I11 sine squared theta. 
Now we can write down the Lagrangian, which is the kinetic energy minus the potential energy, or one half I11 phi squared sine squared theta plus phi dot squared plus one half I33 psi dot plus phi dot cosine theta quantity squared minus MGR cosine theta. Since we have three generalized coordinates, phi, theta, and psi, we'll have three Euler-Lagrange equations to write. First, let's write the equation for theta, which is dl by d theta is equal to d by dt dl by d theta dot. Or i11 theta double dot is equal to i11 phi dot squared sine theta cosine theta minus i33 psi dot plus phi dot cosine theta times sine theta plus mgr sine theta. Note that the Lagrangian does not depend on either phi or psi directly. That means that the generalized momenta for each are constant. The generalized phi momentum is i11 phi dot sine squared theta plus i33 psi dot plus phi dot cosine theta times cosine theta. Likewise, the generalized psi momentum is given by I33 times psi dot plus phi dot cosine theta. And you'll remember that this term here is just the definition of omega-3. So that tells us that the angular momentum I33 times omega-3 is a conserved quantity in our system. First, let's look at steady precession. That means that theta is constant. And since the definition of phi dot depends only on theta, then it too is constant. So we're gonna call it big omega. This top is going to rotate about the z-axis at rate big omega. This type of steady rotation about the z-axis is called precession. And now we'll solve for the rate of precession big omega. We know that the generalized phi momentum is constant, so its time derivative must also vanish too. Therefore, dp phi by dt is equal to 1 half i11 times phi dot squared times sine theta times cosine theta minus i33 times omega3 times phi dot sine theta plus mgr sine theta. Now we can replace each of the phi dot terms with big omega. This gives us a quadratic equation for big omega, which is I11 times big omega squared times cosine theta minus I33 omega 3 times big omega plus MGR is equal to zero. This gives us two roots for big omega, which are written here, but I'm going to talk you through what each of these mean. When I33 times omega 3 quantity squared is greater than 4 times I11 times MGR cosine theta. That means that this square root term here is positive and the top has two real roots. That means that the top can process at two different speeds, big omega plus and big omega minus. Since omega 3 is large compared with all of the other rates, we can show that one of the two roots is much larger than the other. In this limit, where big omega plus is much greater than big omega minus, we have big omega plus is approximately equal to I33 omega 3 divided by I11 cosine theta, and big omega minus is approximately equal to MGR divided by I33 omega 3. You'll note that big omega plus doesn't depend on gravity. So this type of precession can occur even in the absence of gravity. It's not always true that theta dot is equal to zero. In this case, we can't assume then that phi dot is constant either. This means that there might be some kind of bobble in the precession. This bobble this sort of bobble wobble is called mutation, which comes from the Latin word meaning to nod repeatedly. In this system, we will assume, however, that omega-3 is much greater than any of the other rates in the problem. And now we want to solve for the time dependence of both theta and phi. So we also know that there's no net torque in the z direction. So that tells us that the rate of change of angular momentum in the z direction is equal to zero, or equivalently, 
d by dt of i11 phi dot sine squared theta plus i33 omega 3 cosine theta is equal to zero. When we write out this derivative, we end up with I11 phi double dot sine squared theta plus I11 phi dot sine theta cosine theta theta dot minus I33 omega 3 sine theta times theta dot is equal to zero. Since we already established that phi dot and theta dot are very small compared with omega-3, that tells us that this term is approximately equal to zero. So we end up with an equation that relates phi double dot to theta that says I11 times phi double dot times sine theta minus theta dot times I33 times omega-3 is equal to zero. And this equation, we're gonna come back to a fair amount, so we're just gonna call it equation star. If we take the time derivative of star, we know that star is equal to zero, so its time derivative is also equal to zero. We end up with I11 times phi triple dot times sine theta minus I11 times phi double dot cosine theta theta dot minus theta double dot times I33 times omega three is equal to zero. This doesn't seem horribly helpful until we realize that this middle term vanishes. Now we have an equation for phi triple dot in terms of only theta double dot. So now we want to figure out how we can get rid of theta double dot in terms of something that depends on phi. So we can do this if we recall the Euler equation for theta. So this says that I11 times theta double dot is equal to minus I33 times omega 3 times phi dot plus MGR. By substituting in the definition for theta double dot into our equation here, we end up with a second order ODE for phi dot, which says that d squared phi dot by dt squared is equal to I33 omega 3 divided by omega 1 quantity squared times phi dot minus MGR divided by I33 omega 3. But note that this term here and this term here depend only on constants. So let's call them omega n and omega s respectively. This gives us a harmonic equation for phi dot, which says that d squared phi dot by dt is equal to omega n squared times phi dot minus omega s. That tells us that phi dot is equal to omega s plus a cosine omega nt plus gamma where a and gamma are determined from the initial conditions of that problem. We can integrate this to find the time dependence for phi, which says that phi of t is equal to phi naught plus omega s times t plus a divided by omega n times sine omega n t plus gamma. The next thing we want to do is work out our theta dependence. And to do this, we can plug in the equation we just derived for phi into our equation star. And this gives us I11 times A times omega N times sine omega NT plus gamma times sine theta is equal to theta dot times I33 omega 3. From the definition of omega n, which is I33 omega 3 divided by I11, we can divide our equation through by I11. We'll note that we then have an omega n term on either side of the equation. So when we divide through by this omega n term, we end up with an ODE for theta, which reads theta dot is equal to minus A times sine theta times sine omega nt plus gamma. So we could try to integrate this, but it's a lot easier if we know that theta dot, which is the rate that the top bobbles in the z direction, is much smaller than omega n, than omega n, which is the rate that the top bobbles back and forth in the phi direction. So this tells us that sine theta doesn't change very much and is therefore approximately equal to its initial value, sine theta naught.
So now we can integrate the equation for theta, which gives us theta of t is equal to b plus a divided by omega n times sine theta naught cosine omega nt plus gamma. And here b and theta naught come from the initial conditions of our problem. Now that we've got equations for theta, phi, and psi in terms of the physical parameters of the system, what do these solutions look like? So let's go back to our equation for phi dot to have a little bit of an idea. When Lz is greater than L3, that tells us that phi dot is always positive. So theta will always proceed with a single sign. So that looks like this. Phi moves steadily in one direction, and theta oscillates up and down between two values, theta 1 and theta 2. If on the other hand, Lz is less than L3, then phi dot changes signs. This means that phi moves both backwards and forwards while theta oscillates. Today we've discussed the physics and math behind a rotating heavy top. Thank you so much for watching this 12-week series on classical mechanics. This summer I'll be launching a new YouTube channel which will have several series of short lectures on different mathematical and numerical techniques that are frequently used in research level physics. We'll explore both the algorithms themselves and the theory behind them. Some topics we'll cover are linear programming, data analysis, eigenvalue analysis, partial differential equations, and several numerical techniques to solve them, including Newton's method, Runge-Kutta, and gradient descent. Then we'll look at spectral analysis as it relates to both linear systems and differential equations. From there, we'll explore integral transforms and complex analysis with a particular eye on complex differentiation and integration. We'll also look at symmetries and group theory. If there are any other topics you'd like to see, let me know in the comments. Stay tuned here and I'll post the official launch announcement in July or August. I hope to see you there.